This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Welcome back to Business Breakdowns. This is Matt Russell, and today we are covering Renishaw. Renishaw is considered a leading supplier of measuring systems and manufacturing systems, specifically focused on accuracy and precision. Now, what does that mean in layman's terms? Renishaw is a picks and shovels provider to many of the fastest growing end markets in the world. So you can think about anything revolving around semiconductors, robotics, medical devices. Renishaw designs and develops systems for complete precision, control, and reliability. To break down Renishaw, I'm joined by Matt Tong, fund manager at Lion Trust Asset Management. Matt helps simplify this business, bring it into layman's terms, describing both the customer base and exactly what is going on with these precision tools. Then we get into some of the unique dynamics of revenue at this business. You would expect that the current semiconductor cycle would result in a massive windfall for Renishaw, and it might not have been the case quite yet. So we get into that, and then we finish off with a lot of the dynamics around R&D through the cycle, what this will look like, and what the opportunity set is for a business like Renishaw. This is another interesting one getting into the industrial world. So please enjoy this business breakdown of Renishaw. All right, Matt, excited to have you here to talk Renishaw. And this is a name that I will say, I will admit, as I was going through a lot of the research and trying to understand this business, I could understand it conceptually through their presentations, but I needed it to come to life a little bit more. So I went to YouTube, I was watching some of the videos that the company puts out just to get an understanding. And there's some complex operations going on here that I thought you could help just right off the top sketch out for us to the listener who's not familiar with Renshaw. What do they do? What is their expertise? And bring it to life a little bit. So Renshaw are a world leader in metrology. Metrology is the science of measuring things. If you think about the economy today and all that precision manufacturing that goes on in various different high-tech industries, the ability to measure the thing you're making and set up your machines correctly so you have these precision measurements. Think about aerospace where things have got to be very, very precise. What British will do is they produce thousands of different products, but generally involved in either measuring things you've made or setting up your machine so that you have a process or a procedure which has less waste, more efficiency, I guess less human intervention in the manufacturing process. Precision management was the term that stood out to me. And when I was watching these videos, again, I'm going to reference these YouTube videos, which for a listener, it might be helpful to just either look at the pictures or get a sense of the videos as well. There's a lot of equipment, robotics, manufacturing going on. And are these machines Renishaw machines or are they outsiders machines, customers machines where there's Renishaw measuring devices, measuring tools put on there? Where do they fit into that visual? The, the answer is both. I guess a big part of their revenue comes in what they call machine shop. So if any of your listeners or you know, you've seen a machine shop where you've got people operating lathes, bits of metal spinning around being cut, those machines, which are now, I guess, more commonly called CNC, computer primarily controlled machines. So they will typically be made by a machine tool manufacturer, so someone like Fanuc. And on that machine, you will see a Renishaw probe. So a Renishaw probe will be attached to the coordinate measuring machine. The lathe will cut some of the metal and then the Renishaw probe will come and it will hit that metal and go, okay, this bit of metal is this thick or it's got this surface finish on it. So part of their the big route to market for them is them getting specified on original equipment manufacturers, machine tools. That is where they started. They also, as 
the business has evolved, they also now produce their own machines. So they have a device, for example, called an equator, which if you think about a production line, parts are coming through a production line. Part of that, they'll go into a Renishaw equator machine. They'll be measured. And that would generally typically measure them against a reference part. It is on my machine still in tolerance making this thing and it'll move through. So they do have some standalone products. They're also involved in, they've got some medical products as well, which are all theirs. It's a blend between the two, really. And that kind of also is their route to market. Some will be end user pulling, say I want Renishaw, and others will be pushed from the machine tool manufacturer. We often talk about value chains, and maybe we stop the value chain at OEM. But in reality, it goes beyond OEM in terms of who their suppliers are to create the manufacturing tools. And even a step beyond that, you can go to the steel producers, the iron ore miners. It really goes all the way back. You referenced a few of the buyer bases that Renishaw would be working with. I think you mentioned aerospace. It seems like the healthcare industry is really large here. Is there some type of breakdown or concentration that you would reference for Renishaw that's particularly important in terms of end market or industry? If you look at the way they split up the business, and we're talking here about 690 million revenue last year, about 94% of the sales, they say, come from manufacturing technologies. And they have another 6%, which is in 6 7%, which is in, we used to be healthcare division, but they also do analytical devices, so ROM and microscopes. And they're looking for chemical structures, those microscopes. If you look at the manufacturing technologies, there's basically metrology, industrial metrology. So this is things like CNC machines, coordinate measuring machines. So that would be measuring a part, not when it's in a machine, but come off it, basically. They also have position measurement, which is what are known as encoders, effectively. So what an encoder does is it, we have one in your printer at home, but an encoder basically tells you where a thing is. So the speed, something's rotating, or, or its position going backwards and forwards. So encoders is a big market for them. That's about 35, 36% of the sales in that division. And then they've also got an additive manufacturing, which is quite new. And that's basically 3D printing machines with laser bed technology. That's about 7%. And those numbers I just gave you are analyst forecasts. The company themselves are pretty secretive bunch in terms of engagement with investors. So you don't actually get that breakdown from the business themselves, but you kind of know where they're selling. And they're all being sold into machine tools in one way or another. You then got different industries into which they're selling. So I think the largest is precision manufacturing. So that's anything that needs to be precisely engineered that doesn't fall into any of these other categories. Automotive is a big sector. So that's a second, that's about 17% of revenues. So think about anything to do with a car. Specifically as well at the moment, there's a big transition to electric vehicles and the way that these machines are probably going to be a big growth area for the businesses as this happens because the processes for making an EV are very different to an internal combustion engine and things need measuring, obviously, to do that because they're precision engineered bits of care. You then got aerospace industry. Consumer electronics is quite a big division as well. Famously, I think Apple are a customer. So when there's a new Apple device coming out, they tend to sell a lot of product into that. Probably their largest single concentration of customer is in the semiconductor equipment manufacturing division. It's been a bit of a drag on the business in the last few years, but especially when you make these wafers, you need to be able to measure them down to, I think they're experts in the 300 nanometer semiconductor manufacturing. And specifically, they got some things that can actually check these wafers are being made correctly, effectively. So that's their biggest single, I guess, driver of that industry, because it's not obviously a very big industry. There's only going to be a few customers in that. If you listen to the analyst calls, they're always asking about when semiconductors are going to pick up again, because it's one of the things they can actually accurately model in the, I guess, look at things around it. That's the biggest shock that I might have heard. Why has it been a drag and a headwind when literally all the signs in the industry are pointing towards this being positive? Yeah. So if you think about what drives Renishaw's revenue, it's CapEx, it's new CapEx. These parts don't really wear out very much. You need new companies putting down plant and equipment really to get the big sales. I'm talking again about their main division here. So I think it's cyclicality due to COVID. I mean, if you look at the, the amount of money spent, the change in valuation of fabs constructed, it massively boomed in 2021 and it's just collapsed down to single digit growth at the moment. In 24, 1% growth, actually, looking at the thing I'm looking at here. Forecast to bounce back next year. But you look at Renishaw, as just as a business and anecdotally, they've only got about two months order but window. They don't really have a lot of visibility. So on the Q3 earnings call, everyone's like, okay, well, is Semicon coming back? And it's like, well, I think so. But 
hopefully, those timing of inflections in industries are really hard to call, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The two month window is actually quite surprising just in terms of I would have expected it to be much longer <laughs> just in the world of precision and needing these tools and and a lot of that. So is that the case across their business line where it's a short term visibility in terms of the future? Yeah, it really is. And it's been like that for as long as we've tracked it, really. So they'll tend to give you forecasts, which are two, three months ahead. And I guess you can look at things like industrial production. Analysts will look at Japanese machine tool orders as lead indicators. But I think because they're, and themselves being a manufacturer of their own product, they have, and they've got thousands of different products, they have quite a lot where you don't really need a lot of visibility of all the time. And then they have other bits where you might say somebody wants, say, coordinate measuring machine for a bit of JCB equipment or this enormous it's not an off-the-shelf product they'd have, so they'd have to make this for you specifically, and that's going to probably take four or five months maybe. So obviously there will be bits of the business that have longer visibility, but on average it's like a two-month order window, yeah. So you, you can imagine as a listed company what that means for their results. Always missing or beating numbers the whole time. Yeah, I can imagine what it means for the investor who covers the company as well and <laughs> dealing with that volatility and lack of visibility even four to five months for a turnaround is fairly quick just in terms of having the potential to do that. In terms of the revenue model, is it simply a selling of the tools and it's a one-time sale? Is there any type of service or maintenance provided on the back of it? Anything reoccurring in nature to what they're doing? It generally is how they make the money. They design these probes or these bigger machines, make them in their own factory, and then sell them on to either a, an OEM or if it's just a machine to an end user. All of our distributors as well, kind of around the world. So they'll make about 60% gross margin on that manufacturing. In terms of reoccurring revenue and recurring revenue, as I said, this stuff doesn't really wear out. They'll give you some stats around, if you look at who their customers are, it's the same customers year in, year out. So in both their encoder division, which is the second biggest, and also their precision measurement probes and stuff, Something like 70 or 80% of their revenue comes from existing customers. Those existing customers have to be selling their machine tools to other people for them initial to get. There'll be a stocking cycle in that, but they have to be successful and work with successful customers. I think one area they are trying to bring in more recurring, but can't sit moving the dial a lot in terms of the whole overall industry, but it's clearly software. If you think about a machine shop and all the things that are going on in a machine shop, all industrial factory controlling that of our software, looking at which machines have been, you know, are out of tolerance, looking at what needs replacing, and then working with third party providers as well as our own equipment to give these people running factories a view about what's happening on their shop floor. That's kind of an ongoing future growth avenue that they're talking about. Because they've got the probes in there. So they've got a route to customer. It's about connecting them up and data and you know that AI, I'm sure, will be mentioned at some point. So no, it's very much not recurring income but reoccurring from the same customer base, I guess. That makes sense. Yeah, and I guess to use the semiconductor example, which you referenced, it would be the case that it would need to either be a new fab or a new generation chip, essentially, to really drive more orders. If businesses are, NVIDIA is basically just putting out the same chip, they might already have the equipment on hand, the Renishaw equipment on hand to produce that chip. So it's going to require, to your point, some additional capacity or some new generation, which might require a slightly different precision tool to drive more revenue for Renishaw. Exactly. Yeah. It's all about CapEx, really. And before we get too far into the business, we've already, I think we might have already done it. Just going back to the origin story here, you've referenced a lot of the key drivers of today. I think we could just list them endlessly, whether it's AI, chip, automobiles, 3D printing. Everything would require this type of precision. But how far back does Renishaw go? What's the origin story and any key players that played a major role in them carving out this industry? It's a really interesting story and goes along with the way that we invest as well, looking for founders. It was founded by an engineer called Sir David McMurtry, who has just stepped off being their exec chair literally in June this year, having basically run it. When founded it, invented business in 1973 in his house in a small workshop with a guy called John Deere. So these two engineers, I think Sir David, he was a mechanical engineer by trade, and he ended up working at Rolls-Royce. He was an apprentice there, and then he ended up 
becoming the chief designer. He's working on an engine for the Concorde, if you remember that aeroplane, the Olympus engine. And he was getting very frustrated that they couldn't precisely measure the manufacturing process of this engine. So he went back to his workshop with John Deere, who he worked with, and invented something called the Touch Trigger Probe, which is, if you look at any of their videos, it's a bit of metal with a little blob on the end of it. And that's what they used to start measuring things. That was 50 years ago. And that's him starting it in his house. And then if you look through the history of the business, he then... They first moved into a workshop in 1976, had about 20 employees. They founded Renishaw Incorporated in 1981, and it floated on the London stock market in 1983. Sales of $6.5 million, a market cap of about $20 million. It made a million quid of profit. So it was a tiny, small company back then. Head of my team, Anthony, he invested in this company basically for most of his career. He started in 1996. So it's interesting. Moved to their current headquarters in 1985. They were making about 15 and a half million. Even back then, there were sales of 90% overseas. I was looking actually back at their 1985 annual report on Company's House. And this is a good anecdote, and it tells you a bit about the company, actually. So back then, they had this brand new factory. I'll read this out because it captured it for me. These provide both creative and advanced lab facilities for study in all branches of mechanical, electronic, optoelectronic, and software engineering. This unique and work environment provided by the building, its location, the company's challenging brief has attracted some of the leading specialists in their particular fields. The company is headed by one such person, Professor Keith Rathmill, who recently joined from Cranfield Institute of Technology, who is Director of Research and the Head of Robotics and Automation Initiatives. The first of such innovation is the OPT High Performance Laser Scanning Probe, which they launched three years later. So basically, they become a, an engineering excellence business, attracts some really high profile people to come and work for them and continue investing in innovation. So if you kind of go through the years, I mean, in 1995, 62 million in sales, made about 10 million, spent three and a half million quid on R&D, research and development. 2000 sales hit 100 million. By 2005, sales were 150, 25 million in profit. And they started offices in India and Russia. In 2001, so David was knighted for his services to innovation in the UK. Now, interestingly, in more recent history, so in 2021, so back to these founders. So David has run the company his entire life, having started it in the 70s. Him and John sort of control about half the equity, which is very rare for a company of this size in the UK. If you look across America, there are quite a few, but they actually said that they were going to sell the company in 2021. They're in their 80s and they want to retire and move their equity on. But they launched this formal sale process, which is one of the leading 250 engineers in the UK, and then didn't actually find a buyer. And the thing they said was, we're deemed to provide an outcome that satisfactorily met all the interests of all of our stakeholders, effectively. So they really cared about where the company were going to go and who it was going to end up with. And there's not a lot of information other than they didn't lead to anything, but you have the sense that these founders really want to protect their investment, basically. And interestingly, actually, 2024, Siemens came out, so they didn't want to buy the company, but that would have been a natural acquirer. They've now, they're both still on the board. They've both still got half the equity. David's son's come on as a non-exec as well. I guess that's one of the question marks as a shareholder, like what is the future of this company for these two shareholders on the board? And we don't really know. So, no. so that's the history of it, really. It's been a brainchild of one man who's still involved, basically. Huge success. Yeah. A couple hours of researching the business, very much from the cheap seats. M&A still seems like it could certainly be in play given everything that you just described there. But quite an interesting history. And to see founders of the business still involved at this point, I think it's always very interesting when you have those types of businesses and stories. Over the years, have there been major competitors to Renishaw? Or who is the competitor that stands out or the competitive set that stands out in terms of doing what they do? Yeah. So, I mean, depending on which market you're looking at, there's different competitors. I think probably the biggest one in their key market would be Hexagon, which are listed in Sweden, I think, Hexagon. Carl Zeiss as well, that business. And then if you look at position measurement, I think the biggest one's Heider Hain. In additive manufacturing, they've got quite a few different competitors there. They've got smaller ones and then in their medical division, where well, they've just got a couple of products which are quite interesting. So somebody like Bruker or Thermo Fisher might be competitors. But it's really, I guess there are competitors in it, but for them, it's all about investing in R&D and innovation to make sure they've got best market-leading products. And that's the way that they protect their economic mate, I guess, is 
is R&D, and then also just growing their distribution network and growing their partners in terms of OEMs. Are they unique in the sense that they operate in so many different markets? It seemed like what you were suggesting there is there are niche or industry-specific competitors in most of the markets that they operate in. I'd say most of the competitors are quite big, and most of those have other divisions as well. There's not really a pure play competitor globally. There's divisions of other businesses that have metrology businesses in them, but there's not a metrology business which looks like Renishaw, basically. If you're looking for guidance from somebody else, I mean, Hexagon is one I would look at. It certainly makes sense that it either would be part of a much larger conglomerate or maybe something vertically integrated where this stands out as the pure play operator. We've talked a little bit on the revenue model and very interesting revenue model just in terms of the visibility. How does that impact the margin profile of the business? Is there more visibility or more of a normalized operating margin that they tend to see through cycles over time? How do you frame it as an investor just on the profitability and the margin profile of the business? It's a business that's vertically integrated. And especially the last four or five years post-COVID, it's been a lot of problems for industrials to deal with in terms of wages going up, can't get semiconductors, shipping's gone through. I mean, every company globally, but specifically you're vertically integrated. And then you want to obviously sell the products onto people at, and make money at the end of the day. But if you take on those difficult years out, and actually they went through a restructuring in 2020, took a load of cost out. And I guess similar to lots of companies globally, unsurprisingly, that what they're trying to target is mid single digit to high single digit growth organically, which comes from got number one, number two market shares in certain things they do, which are growing and driven by these long term trends. But as we talked about, they don't have a lot of visibility. And they're trying to make 20% plus EBIT margin over the cycle and a 15% return on capital. That's what they're aiming at. Obviously, it's quite hard from year to year to control those inputs and the outputs, but that's what they're targeting through the cycle. I mean, the way we look at it is we use something called cash flow return on invested capital, which is a kind of a similar ROIC, except it looks at cash flow and includes tax inflation. The last 10 years, that's been about 13.5%, which is double what your UK your average UK stock makes. So it's about twice as capital return efficient as your average company. Interestingly, I invest in quite a lot of UK industrials and that margin profile is not dissimilar to others, but others will have a lot more solidity in their earnings because they have more visibility and they have longer cycles and managing to deliver those numbers through the cycle, even though you've got this variability and you've got quite a big fixed cost base of people, 5,000 people spending hundreds of millions on R&D and CapEx every year. So to make that, it's quite hard. And talk about the bear points, they're putting down a lot of CapEx at the moment and whether or not that's going to lead to high sales, that's we hope. Interesting to see that return profile over the past 10 years. One point I wanted to touch on, that mid to high single digit organic growth, is that top line? Is that profitability? It's an impressive number almost regardless. Curious where in the income statement. Yeah, so that's top line. It's a mid to single top line and 20% plus EBIT margin. And then they'd say 15% return on invested capital. That's basically what they're targeting. Which is, I mean, if you look at what they've done the last 10 years, I've done about 10% over 10. So they have managed it. And if you think about the long-term trends of society and the economy, and I think it feels like a realistic target without being over ambitious. I mean, just thinking about the end markets, thinking about, pretty much any industry that we talk about that has high growth attached to it, there is some precision required in terms of whatever they're building out. So it certainly connects from the basic smell test. On the free cash flow point, on the CapEx point, what does that look like today? What do those cycles look like in terms of CapEx investment? I I can understand the R&D side of things and where that might be going from the CapEx side of things. What are they investing in? Is it hard asset infrastructure to build these tools? Are there other things that you would point to? I mean, there's two big uses of the cash that the company generates. The first, as you said, is R&D. So they're spending, I guess, most of their R&D, first of all, is spent on new product design or new product development, about 20% is maintenance. As you're looking at over the last, or well, since 2014, over the last nine years, I've spent about 800 million on R&D in total. So every year, I mean, I hope it was about 100 million last year, 85 the year before that. And that's engineering talent, generally in the UK, investing in new products. I mean, they're spending about 
13 to 14 percent of sales and R&D, which your typical industrial spend about 10. That is one of the big reasons I think they've been so successful. But it's also one of the things you could say they're overspending. And if you're a private equity firm, you come and buy them and just say, right, you're going to do 10 now. There's a massive amount probably of overspend there. And we'll talk about some of the things that haven't worked maybe in, in a bit, but obviously not all of R&D is successful, I would say. And then on the CapEx side, yeah, it's all about, they're an interesting company actually, because they say that their biggest customer is actually themselves because they make and they have their own factory, which is highly automated, which has their own equipment in it, which helps it become more highly automated. So they're almost testing stuff on themselves. So a lot of this CapEx, they've put a lot more, basically increase the manufacturing capacity in their Michigan site in Wales by about 50%. They're spending, I think it was 50 to 75 million over the next few years doing that. That's a, basically a big old building, which is going to be making their machines in it, specifically there. They've got a new additive manufacturing machine, which has been proving popular, I think. And they've got big hopes that that will grow. So they're putting in that. And also they're spending CapEx on their existing facilities to make them more efficient. But I would say they're generally done, say 23 and 24 are outsized because they're building the Michigan side. They're putting more into that. Probably below that, you're probably going to do 30, 40 million a year, I guess. They're more like 70, 80 the last two years. And I guess when that tails off, CapEx will come down probably. And then some of the questions have been, well, when you look to allocate that capital, are you going to do any share buybacks? Management were like, no, not doing it at the moment. They've got plenty of ideas to invest in. So if they can get my data says 14% return on capital, then cash flow return on capital, then you want to be doing that rather than a buyback probably. Yeah, so it's outsized at the moment. I think that will give them capacity for quite a lot more sales than they've got at the moment. So it should be an event in their history where in five, six years, they're going to get more operational gearing through that. And it could be, I think it's definitely depressing their margins a little bit at the moment because such is the nature of putting in CapEx, basically. So they're quite conservative accounting as well. It's always that interesting trade-off where with the R&D, you're going to have some type of failure rate on a percentage of it. But it's always difficult to make that show up on a spreadsheet, particularly when the time horizon might be further out. On some of these facilities that you referenced, and maybe even just the end product itself, how much of this is off-the-shelf tools, materials that they have that they will sell to a customer versus how much of it is customized for each end customer? When I think about precision, I almost think that a lot of what they would have to do would have to be customer-specific and, and selling to them. But it did sound earlier in the conversation like they might have some stuff which they're selling off the shelf. So just some some gauge on that. If you haven't gone through the business properly, but if you look at the precision measurement division, which is machine tool builders. So this is selling encoders, basically. So these are things that measure where the machine tool is at any one point in its lifestyle and probes. Those things are going to be quite off the shelf. So the machine tool builder was, okay, I want one this size that fits into this machine and they'll go, oh, we've got one of these. And actually one of the benefits they've got is depending on how much you want to spend and what the machine is, they've got a good range of product across that so they can match for cost versus requirements. So if you look at that, that's off the shelf. They've got more encoders which are going into, they're sticking them on industrial robots so that you know where the robot arm is basically. And they've got machines that will help you calibrate the robots to set it up in the first place, which basically takes the robot through a dummy run before it's let loose on a manufacturing plant. Again, that stuff's pretty much off the shelf, standard size stuff. It's really only some of the bigger systems where you're not going to, depending on who the customer is, if you want a coordinate measuring machine on standalone that isn't part of another machine tool builder's product, then they're going to have to make that for you. But there's not loads of stuff like that. And then if you look at the additive manufacturing machines, they're like a standard product, basically. So they're making all the same size. And then they've got these surgical robots as well that they make. Again, they're kind of standard. So it's mainly more standard parts. And I guess another clever thing about Renishaw and design for manufacturing, I did manufacturing university and design for manufacturing was a thing like 25 years ago. But thinking about when you make a product, can you design it to be made easily? And the bits that you make it out of, can they be on lots of different bills and materials. Because if you can do that, if you can standardize your manufacturing, you lower your costs and make your life easier. And they do lots of that as well. So yeah. Makes way more sense for a successful business to have found a way to standardize a lot of the products that they're making. I appreciate the correction there. And 
what I was getting at is they're not building new facilities for specific customers or anything along those lines. A large percentage is actually standardized, which makes more sense. And when you think about that CapEx as it relates to where it's going, is it tied to specific industries, whether it's healthcare or something else? Or is it just more broad based? Is that a level of detail that they provide? It isn't specific industries. No, it is their general broad based and it, it is their additive manufacturing. I think a lot of it's to make them making these machines more efficient. And a big question mark is whether or not additive manufacturing can actually make it into a, a way of mass manufacture. I don't know if you know, but additive manufacturing, 3D printing has been around for 30, 40 years, generally used in prototypes. So that's funny. You want to make a one off of something so you can print it and that's great. But the problem you have is if you want to make a thousand of them takes too long and the cost per parts too much. So depending what you're making, like if you're making screws, you'd never additive manufacture those because they're just too simple. But if you've got these quite complex shapes, like the microphone I'm looking at on the top there, which maybe it's got some holes in the middle of it. So that's a bad example because it's really cheap, but something that has a very complicated structure, they can be better made by 3D printing, but it still takes a long time. You've got effectively a powder bed of metal with four lasers in their machine going around and building up the product over time. But then they've put a lot of capacity in for making these machines. But what they really do need to do is find some customers who are going to start making stuff in the manufacturing facilities for production using these machines. They've got quite an interesting innovation they've just released where if you think about the way that these things are done, basically it's a bit like a squeegee. It squeegees out some metal. Then once that's been put flat, then the lasers come down and laser the shape. And then it lays another amount of metal on top. And currently what happens is it waits till the squeegee has gone all the way across before the lasers start firing. Well, they've just got some new software that means the lasers can follow the squeegee behind the metal. That's basically increased the production time by about 100%. That's the kind of innovation you need to, for this to break through. They've been working on it for the division they've started in 2015, so nine years ago. It still doesn't have its own line in the results. So analysts reckon it might do 30, 40 million, but not sure really. It seems like the visibility across the board is so challenging here. And for obvious reasons why, in terms of the end markets that you're dealing with, the challenge of getting something standardized, even 3D printing, to your point, it feels like it's been around for a very long period of time. But 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was what AI was. It was this major, major theme in terms of the next huge market innovation that seems to have quieted down in a similar way that Internet of Things is quieted down. But some breakthroughs can obviously happen at any given moment. And then you can think about the size and potential of that market. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be estimated growing 10, 15%. So it's growing more than their other end markets. You can see what they're betting on it. And they have got a specific niche of they've got different competitors, but they've got full manufacturing medium sized machine with this technology because of different technologies. Theirs is probably the market leader. The stickiness with their customers seems to be a key thing. What drives the decision in terms of choosing Renishaw versus choosing a competitor? Is price a relevant point in the sale process? Anything you can share there? Because it does seem like there's some stickiness here. If you look at the case studies and you see why people choose them, it's because they're solving customers' issues. We have a problem in, with something. We need it solved. And Renishaw can provide the answer. Obviously, they spend a lot of money developing new products in R&D, and they've been world leaders in it. They've also got a very large distribution network. So I think they're in 67 countries. And that started really back in 1980. They were just in the US. They had a plant in the US and Ireland. And over the years, what they've done is they've grown. And what they have is these technology centers near customers. And that could be an OEM customer or that could be an end market customer, the person building whatever, who's buying that machine. And it's Renish or engineers on the ground helping you set up the machine, helping you fix problems. Yes, you get a market leading product, but you also get world-class support for it as well from someone who's in your local area. That really does breed stickiness. And of course, the cost of these things, when you think about the cost of an industrial robot, is not much in the total. If you think about those end markets, they tend to be relatively slow in innovating. You know, your average auto will make the same VW Polo for 10 years before they change it. Aerospace, very long duration build programs for airlines. So kind of once you're in there, and you've worked, and then you're going to, okay, we're going to innovate on the next thing. We're going to bring out the next polo. Okay, well, there's probably a four or five year lead in. 
and you're going to be working all the way along with your partner. So by the time it comes to like specification, they're already going to win it. So yeah, it's about brand. It's about R&D. It's about support. Probably those are the three things. And yes, they have put up prices in the last year on some products to recover margin, but it's not really a price-led sell, I don't think. I mean, they do talk about cheaper competition from China potentially coming in. That China is a big market for them as well. So you always have to be alive to that price. But like a lot of engineers, if you're trying to win just on price and you're based in the UK, you're stuffed. <laughs> yeah. And many of the industries that they're dealing with, the risk associated with sacrificing on quality in order to get better price is not worth the reward there. And especially when it represents such a small percentage of the overall cost of whatever they're building. So we certainly, to your point, I love finding those types of industries and players that operate in those industries. Over time, have there been historical customer wins that have represented something massive? I think you referenced Apple before, but have there been either wins or losses that have driven a large change in the financial profile of the business? I mean, a few times they've had big orders out of the, out of Asia Pack, which is their biggest region. So I think last year Asia was China's twenty three percent. APAC 13 and Japan 10. So biggest 45%, US is like 20%. So they have had in previous years like a bump a year from that region. They're quite a secretive company in terms of they don't give you a big breakdown of even their split. They don't meet analysts. If you want to see them, you have to go to their aid. They have this capital market they once a year. So you get the bus down to that. And you can have a look around the factory and they'll answer questions. And they answer questions to their analyst calls. But they don't have a slide in a deck with logos on it. These are our customers. It seems to be a thing with industrials where they'll preference a large loss from a specific customer on a conference call, not mention that customer. Oftentimes, you know exactly who the customer is. In the particular case of Asia, and just using the Apple example, Apple using Foxconn really to drive a lot of the manufacturing of what they're doing, would Redishaw sell to a Foxconn in that example? Is that how the process would work? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure, no. I think probably be driven by Foxconn. I mean, how deep do Apple get into their manufacturing? Are they design the factories, their stuff's made, and they probably are, right? They've got enough capital to do that. Sure, they do quality control in terms of who the providers of the equipment are and whatnot, but I don't know what level either. Curious was an interesting point in terms of where in the chain they fall. I mean, certainly that revenue would be in that region, right? It wouldn't be in the US. Because that's where, I guess, a lot of precision stuff's made in the world, so their revenues match where industry is. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense. I think you've hit on a lot of the debates for investors when it comes to semiconductors, when it comes to visibility in terms of revenue with the CapEx cycle. Is there anything that stands out that we didn't hit on that's kind of a key debate from the investing side of things? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look back the last few years and you put it together with these founders, if I was going to make a bear case on the company, which I don't want to, but I think it's still a fantastic investment and we're a shareholder. This is not investment advice, by the way. If you look last year, they had 20% downgrades. People are waiting for the semiconductor cycle to turn. We don't know when that's going to happen. Actually, their record year in profit was 2018. So that's six years ago. And that was the year that Sir David stepped down from being exec chair and Will who's the current CEO, became CEO. And Will's been in the business since 96 or 7. He was on the apprenticeship scheme. And we'll probably talk about why this company succeeds. But one reason is because they invest massively in their apprenticeship, growing their own talent, basically. And he's been around a long time. But 2019 was a really difficult year for that business. They had, if you look back, 50% downgrade in earnings forecasts from the start of the year to the end of the year. Back to the visibility cycle. If you think back to them, there was a big China-US trade war going on, which was affecting their own market. We had issues with Brexit in the UK that were still rumbling on at that point as well. Then we obviously had 2020, COVID, and we're kind of still coming out of the back of that four years later. So we haven't made as much money as they did six years ago. That happened to be the year that their talismanic exec chair stepped back and they got a new CEO. And I mean, I think it's probably bad luck rather than bad management. Obviously still heavily involved. And if you look now, I mean, I was talking about return on capital in the system we use. And what you can see now is actually that they are running probably lower margin forecasts at the moment because we're waiting for some operational agreement to come back in again. So does, that doesn't worry me so much. But look at their asset utilization, which is sales over asset base, which is the other key component of 
the other input into cash flow return on invested capital, that is actually materially worsening in the next couple of years because they're putting all this capex in. So you look at the maths and you go, well, their return 2018, the seafront was 19 and the forecast for 24 was six and a half. So you're like, okay, well, this business has become less efficient effectively. Now, that is a debate. Is it just a cyclical low point? Is this a white elephant they're building? Or are sales going to pick up in 27, 28 kind of thing, 26, 27, 28? So I think that would be one thing. I mean, I think you look at the history of the business. I mean, they take a really, really long-term view about investing. If you look at their healthcare division, which is in 2010, that thing had 20 million of revenues, it's only got 40 now. So it's taken, it's doubled, but it's taken since 2014 years. And it's a 5.5% revenue CAGA versus their group, which is about 11. They continue to invest in that. And they're making some world-leading products in these surgical robots that are involved in putting electrodes into people's brains. They do those and they involved in these drug trials, which allow people, if you've got Parkinson's, it's effectively putting needles into your brain to deliver drugs that can get through the drug brain barrier. And they're involved in drug trials to help cure Parkinson's. They didn't make any money out of this division until 2018, I think. So I've got a really long-term view about investing and that's what they do do. And you know you're going to get that. But of course, back to the additive manufacturing, I mean, that was 10 years old and wrote off 17 and a half million of structure in 2020. And you're like, well, it's not really delivered yet. So you've got to back the innovation continuing and you've got to back the long-term drivers, but there's question marks. And then you've got the management because they're there, they own half the company. It's a private, half private company. The attitude to the investors tells you that. That's great. And that's what I love to see because don't talk to me, run your company. You know, that's the most important thing. But in the long run, they're not going to be there. So if a new management come in and go, right, where's my LTIP putting out? It just changes behavior massively. Management is incentivized on different structures to what they are now. That could be a bear point. It's kind of a future bear point. But if you invest now, and then some of these investments don't pay off, and then the management leave in 2026, you're like, oh, it's timing, right? It's got so many interesting dynamics there when it comes to approaching this as an investor, particularly as a public investor. Because to all of your points, I think if this was a private business, it would be easier to wrap your head around some of these things. And you could take it in two different approaches, maybe from the private equity side to your earlier point, they could slash a lot of these things and sweat the assets and squeeze out extra profitability. You want to look at more of the growth opportunity. You keep investing in these things and don't worry so much about the cyclicality. How do you approach it as a public investor when it comes to valuation framework and dealing with the cyclicality that you're going to see, is there any type of approach that you found that works with a business like this? We actually invest in a broad range of industrial. So it's part of a portfolio, as most of your people on the show. So it's not, we haven't got 10 positions, we've got 60 or something. So that's one thing. It's part of my portfolio of industrials, and it's the most cyclical one. I think the way that we generally deal with it is like a lot of other cyclicals actually that we invest in is you want to perversely sell them when they're really cheap and buy them when they're really expensive. I'm thinking about the recruiters here similarly, which have had a terrible time. But in the case of Renishaw, if it's just had a massive upgrade, then you probably want to sell some. And if you have a massive downgrade, you want to buy some because net net, it's gone bottom left to top right for 30 years. So it's about timing that and probably have a cool holding. Valuation is quite a slipper in it because it can go up and down because it's got quite a lot of operational gearing. Just when it looks really cheap, it's probably when its earnings are peaking. You think you want to buy it, you actually want to sell it. And then the other way around. And at the moment, it's probably looking fair value within my industrials bucket. I think it's had downgrades this year. The shares are flat, so it's got more expensive. But we are grappling in a post-COVID valuation world as well, where rates are at five and is the last 10 years of a I call it a UK industrial training on 25 times PE. Is that the right number anymore? Should it be 20? That's a debate we have the whole time, really. But I mean, our investment process, we tend to take very long-term view. I mean, I mentioned it re- briefly earlier, but my guy runs my team, Anthony. So he joined here in 1997. He started his career in like 1985. And he's held it ever since. That's our view. Take a really long-term view of investment and just try and track and make sure. And that's my point about the bear case on it, you've got to look through that and go, what do we think? Do we think it's changed? Is there more competition? Have they suddenly started making investments that aren't going to pay off? Or do we think that continue investment in innovation and culture and it's going to pay off, I guess, and we take the latter view. But 
that's how you got to think about it, I think. That's a great way to frame where the center of the debate lies, is taking that view on the investment that they're making today and how that's going to pan out in the future years. You can cut to the core of it. There's all these other things, but that's really what it comes down to and having some type of visibility in that. It's been an excellent conversation. I will say it is not the easiest business to understand from the outside. So getting to talk through it, learn some of the uniqueness of what they do is incredibly helpful. We close these conversations out with just lessons that we think could be broad-based from looking at this name that you might be able to apply elsewhere. What lessons stand out from Renishaw that you think you could apply elsewhere? I think it's probably lessons for people who run companies, which we meet a lot of, and lessons for people who invest in them as well. It's one of the biggest founder-led companies left listed in the UK. I mean, it's tiny on a global scale. It's about three and a half, three point four billion billion, let's say, which is if you're US investors, you'd be like, oh, this is a tiny micro I've never heard of it kind of thing. So but for UK, it's quite successful. And why has it done that? Because they've continually invested in their product to drive competitive advantage. I mean, they've got 1,500 patents. They file about 100 patents a year, so they're continually investing. So think about, for somebody running a company, what is your competitive advantage, whatever it is, just keep investing in that and thinking about it. If you stop, you're dead. Second thing is they don't meet the city. They don't really want to engage with the city. And I do think some management teams get a bit obsessed by that, and especially bigger companies, quarterly earnings calls, et cetera. But I do think for operators, if you can just look after the company, the numbers will do the talking for you. And you don't need to keep spending all your time doing PR on the city. Just run the company that you're supposed to be running, and then the share price will look after itself. And then the third thing for companies, which the most important thing for a company is culture. We're looking for companies that have got intangible barriers to competition. One of the key ones is culture. And you think about any company, if people hate working there, it's going to be a disaster. They continually invest in your culture, and that's what they've done. 6% of their workforce are apprentices or graduates they've hired. So they come in and they all they know is Renishaw. And all they know is Renishaw. And if you can keep that going, and it's going to be more difficult when John and Sir David finally leave, but keep investing in that. So I think from so if I run a company, that's what I'd say. That's what you can learn from these guys. I think for investors, valuation, I mean, for me, valuation is in the long run, it's not the most relevant thing to look at. I mean, this company floated, it did a million quid of profit. And it floated on about 20 times earnings. So let's say you paid 100 times profit instead, 20 times. And 20 is quite, you know, 20 times P is quite expensive for it. Could be. Well, you'd still have made 9% compound for 38 years if you'd have paid 100 times. And actually, you've made 125 times. So first of all, valuation in the long run is less relevant, right? In the short run, of course, it tries some valuation. So try and think about that. I'd say back to the first point. The second thing is, okay, what is important then? Competitive advantage and return on capital. So that's why I say live for companies have got those two things. Because if they can compound their capital at a higher rate of return than the cost of capital, you get compounding like you see in Renishaw. It's a great example of that. And then probably the final thing would be back to the management team point. If you man- look at the incentives of your management team, because if all they care about is their LTIPs paying out, what their owner is going to do, they're going to take short term decisions for their own benefit because they're human like everybody else. If you can find companies with owners who take a long term view, who aren't incentivized that way, you're probably in a better place. Those are the lessons I'd say for investors as well in this thing. So compounding works, valuation is not that important really in the long run and how are the people running the company incentivized? Are they incentivized like you or are they incentivized to hit some arbitrary target and put R&D at 5% for five years so their else it pays out and they won't do a buyback? Yes. Rich history in terms of the business, interesting people behind it all unique financial model and niche in terms of the industries that they operate with. So, so many interesting things about this one. Thank you for sharing the knowledge and bringing this one to the table. It's been a fun conversation and we really appreciate it, Matt. Thanks, Matt. And yeah, don't feel like we can scratch the surface really, but there we go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is just the beginning. We like to get people from zero to seven on the 10 scale, just in terms of introductory level foundational knowledge on a name. And I think we've done that here. So plenty more to learn about, but thank you for introducing it to us. No problem. To find more episodes of breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com.